So there's one fish that's been eluding me for a very long time, and it's actually the fish that got me into spearfishing. It started when I was planning to take my wife to Malaysia to go scuba diving. I wanted her to feel comfortable, so I signed us up for a course. The teacher noticed that I liked the water. He actually pulled me aside and showed me a 70 pound white sea bass that he held like this. Then he said, you should be doing this instead of scuba. So back in college, my cousin, you guys might know him as Kevin from Epic Gardening. Well, he was going to UCSB at the time and he mentioned that he was going spearfishing, going through the kelp and I thought he was crazy. But after seeing that there's this monster fish in my own backyard, I knew that I needed to do it myself. But I honestly thought it'd be easier. It's been four years of slogging through the murky cold water. Brutal. Waking up early, going in late. Hunting the white sea bass is actually just a mind game. You need to learn how to be comfortable with uncomfort. You'll have cracking arms of kelp tentacles pulling your every limb. The cold water will start to give you the shakes. And not being able to see in the murk We'll just put thoughts of predators being on the other side of the veil. So how did I finally get one? Well, I almost didn't. I woke up early, packed the boat, and drove to the ramp to meet up with my buddy, Adrian. After 45 minutes of LA traffic and almost getting to the launch ramp, I realized I forgot the transom. I contemplated, came up with every excuse. Do I scrap the day? I called Adrian and was like, hey bro, bad news. I think we got to scrap today. He paused for a second and then just said, it's better to show up. So I turned back around, waited through traffic again, grabbed the missing gear, and I knew it was gonna be a good day because after 40 minutes at the spot, my buddy landed a 30 pound white sea bass. So from talking to a bunch of experts on the podcast over the last couple of years, I've learned a lot. And a big key lesson is about keeping calm and barely moving through the water if you want one of these fish. So I chilled out at the surface, barely moving, and then I saw it. I actually didn't see the whole fish. Just a huge broadside of shiny silver. But when I had my hands in the gill plate, I looked at its eyes and realized this is a big fish. Once I got to the car, I drove to the dive shop and had it weighed 65 pounds. Wow, not bad for my first white sea bass. Unfortunately, my GoPro died before I shot it. This fish was destined just to be a memory. A few pictures from the phone, but not that exact moment. But then I remembered, what about Giyotaku? It's this Japanese tradition of ink painting of an animal that means something to you. So I sent a DM to the best guy in town, Dwight, fishing for Giyotaku. And in the DM, I was like, hey man, do you got time for a Giyotaku of my fish? And he was like, yeah, let's meet up tomorrow. Flash forward to the next day and it's bright and early. I arrive at his house and the fish is still in the kill bag. I was so tired from the night before that I threw 40 pounds of ice in the bag and just left it on the cargo carrier outside on the back of my car. But once the fish was inside the house, we took it out and we started removing the slime. Dwight used a spoon to start scraping it off. Check out this head. I mean, look at the size of this thing and the eye is still clear, it's not cloudy. But once we finished scraping with the spoon, we took paper towels and dried it off. Now this sucker, man, look at the tail. Is nice. Now it's time to put it on the table so it's easier for us to start gyutakuing. And let me introduce you to Dwight. Today we're going to do a Japanese fish print of my 65 pound white sea bass. And we got none other than Dwight Hong, right? Huang. 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 Dwight Huang, uh, fishing for gyutaku, probably arguably the best gyutaku artist on the globe. So I appreciate that. You're here, man. Dude, hey. we got this big fish. It's huge. <laughs> it's really, really big. I, yeah, I've never seen one this big before. It's impressive. Fantastic. Well, uh, what's the first step? I know we scaled, or we uh, got the goop off. Yeah, so we're gonna continue getting the goop off, because otherwise that sort of ruins the, the print. It'll make blobs on the image, and it just doesn't look good. On a fish this big, there's so much girth, I'm gonna cut them off. So traditionally the ink comes from a ink stone in water. You grind that for a bit, about 30, 40 minutes. But a fish this big, it just takes, it would take way too long to grind that much ink. I did have a few people ask. So, I mean, this is rough. 57. Now we're getting to the good part. It's fun watching a master at work. Instead of just jumping straight in and painting the whole fish, Dwight does smaller test prints to make sure everything is just right. 
That means figuring out the proper ink consistency, the proper pressure of his fingers on the paper, and a bunch more subtleties. I mean, look at this crazy cool first print. The details are amazing. A lot of people print on fabric just because it's easier, but paper gets a lot more details and I think it looks a lot prettier. So the ink is made out of soot and water. Basically, it's a really fine piece of charcoal that you grind with water. And so what happens is that when you apply the ink, it gets embedded into the paper and when the water evaporates, it's, it's, the, it's the soot that's inside the paper. And there's this wonderful subtle dimensionality to it instead of like, other pigments where, where it'll sit on top of the paper instead. And so this one, is, it's subtle, but there's this dimensionality to it, it's very pretty. Oh, that's awesome. Is that just like a razor? What I find fascinating about Gyutaku is that it's more than just a painting. It's a story disguised in a beautiful piece of art. And I feel that Dwight really does have a talent for making it pop on the canvas. Let's get back to our Gyutaku. Dwight is placing pieces of paper towel in the various cavities of the fish. That's the nose, the nostrils, the anus. And what that's doing is preventing ink from pooling up. As you can see here, he is coating the whole fish because we're about to do the main event. But if you leave those openings open, you're going to get blobs when you push down on the paper. And you don't want that because you don't want to ruin the whole aesthetic. But now we're getting to the hard part. And Dwight was telling me that the bigger the fish, the harder it is to get a good print. And this is because you have so much more surface area, things can go wrong. That's why he brought in his wife to help make sure that the canvas wasn't falling in the wrong way so that everything is neat and organized. But look at this. This print is just fantastic. Oh my God. That's a little different. How big were the other ones? 30, maybe 30, 40, I don't think 40. Jeez. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Now that the print was nearly complete, Dwight took the fins off the fish so he can finish up at a later date. And we rinsed off the sea bass and put it back in the kill bag. And I took it to my buddy's restaurant where he then proceeded to dry age it for 10 days. Flash forward to the day of the party. We were all super stoked when my buddy's wife shot this 73 pounder. This thing was probably the biggest one shot this season, to my knowledge, and it was monstrous. It put this 65 pounder to shame, but now let's cut it up and start serving it to the folks. And uh, yeah, let's just feast it. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate you guys coming out. I'm not gonna lie, it's a little bit challenging to fillet a fish in the center of a banquet hall, but that's what we did here. My buddy has a restaurant, it's called Paracel in the OC. If you guys ever have an event that you wanna do, definitely hit him up. He's always super generous and kind to allow us to use this space when we want to have a little bit of fun. So thanks, Matt. Appreciate you for uh, hosting this event. Here's the carcass. We uh, scrape the bones. We scrape the meat off with a spoon. We get this, we're gonna make it into like fish cakes. And then finally, we're going to take this to the back and get the stones out. Stones are in this area right here. So this thing is such a monster head. All right, we got ourselves some White sea bass Check out this spread. Matt and his wife crushed it. We have the dry aged white sea bass fillets. We have the homemade white sea bass fish cakes. Friends and family around the dinner table. I could not be happier. All right, dry aged white sea bass, how is it? Delicious. All right. What an amazing experience. Now I can finally check that fish off my bucket list, and I hope this inspires you to go find one yourself. Dive safe out there. <laughs>